and uh, of course it is uh, if you cannot accept it so the agenda of our webinar is going to be let's say four parts welcoming and checking in now and i will show you what our second question will be first uh, Lask and myself will offer you a little bit of the framing about what is placemaking and what is this whole handbook and approach that we are currently developing with the program. Then we will have Sam and myself again sharing a little bit of tips and experiences about how we have been working with schools and the movement and the placemaking. And the third part is the co-creation part. So this is where the floor will be offered to you in order to exchange and share your experience and knowledge. And the last part, we will be reflecting about what we have learned. But first of all, to, to land in our meeting, please share in the chat your name, where you're connecting from, because you see we have lots of people from around uh, Europe and internationally, and one memory of the schoolyard that you might have from your childhood. What is maybe one memory that uh, um, relates to the topic also that we have for the day? So let's, I will offer you two minutes to do that and you can use the chat box for that. I will also share my name. Excellent. We have Serbia, Sweden, Poland, Turkey, Montenegro, Lithuania, Poland, England. Oh, wow. <laughs> Ireland, Ireland, Romania, Bulgaria, Cyprus. Anna loved playing basketball from Cyprus. Mm, Andreu from Spain saying that uh, using old tires to slide downstairs at school when we were very, very young. Oh, it sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> Ellen shares about her playground being concrete and gray. Let's see if this has changed or how we can change it, maybe. Matthias from Estonia says that the, play that the whole old town was his playground. Melinda is checking in from Hungary. Ah, give me there from Hungary as well. Nice to see you again. Hi. Hi. Uh, Alaska says about not having enough trees and greenery, unfortunately. Miriam is uh, sharing about the, the big school here that she used to have. That's very nice. And Jakub about playing everywhere. That's very interesting because many of these aspects you will also see them coming up into the content that we're going to share from now on. So let's start a little bit with the content. Thank you all. You can continue writing us in the chat. Laska and I will be able to follow. Um, and in case you have, I would also like to share one more tool we will be using today. So on the one hand, we have the slides that we will be presenting content to you. And we have also created a mirror board that I will share the link in the chat box. Oh, sorry for the horns from the car, so I don't know if you can hear the traffic outside. So in the chat box, I'm sharing the link to Miro. This Miro board will be our, our own playground today. So it has two parts. In the first part, in the first part that we are here, it's a, it's a part of the board that you can use throughout the whole session. It's for you to write down your notes, your questions, your ideas, anything that you might want to keep as a, in, in your mind from the session. So this is part 
the first part that you can use throughout the whole session today. And the second part, we will be, we will be showing it to you later. It's about the co-creation part. So for now, we're sticking only to this part. So feel free to take notes or write your questions in there. I'm sharing this screen again. Okay. And I will continue now going to the introduction for place meeting. Last are we doing well in terms of tech and um, everything? Yes, thank you. Perfect. So as like Alaska already introduced me, I'm an urban planner and geographer. So in my background, I come from the engineering of School of Engineering and the Geography Studies. But while I was studying, I realized that there is a softer side of me uh, in how I approach uh, cities. So I, I kept asking the why behind the how and the what that I was seeing as an engineer. So this led me to, to work with placemaking. Placemaking is the approach that fits very much my way of thinking, my way of in interacting with people, and my way of bringing many different aspects like education, like culture, and then engineering as well in the same framework of working. So um, for now, I'm very, until now, I've been very, very lucky uh, to have a three role, uh, uh, let's say three identities. The one is the one that you see in the center, it's about Stipo. I'm an urban planner working for Stipo, representing them in Greece, which is a, an agency, let's say, based in the Netherlands. I'm also part of the Citadel level, which is a knowledge program sharing about placemaking. And I'm a board member for Placemaking Europe. So today we bring to you content and approaches from all these different roles and uh, hats that I'm wearing. So what's placemaking? I, I'm bringing you with my first picture to my hometown. I'm from Thessaloniki in Greece. And this is a picture that I very much love because it has the main elements for me that have to do with placemaking. It has to do with natural elements. You see the sea, you see some green, you see the built environment, be it good or bad. You, you see it there. You see the public space, but most importantly, you see people hugging and having their shoes off. So this is the essence for me. How does the built environment meet with what us people need the more, which is the sense of being in comfort, in safety, and be feeling uh, um, the pleasure of being out in the public space. So place many has to do about how you go from space, that it might be the physical environment, the built environment, so what we usually construct or what the nature has constructed for us, into a place. The place has the, the elements of memory, has the elements of feelings, of emotions, of interaction. So how do we move from the one in space to place? These are, the, let's say, the two patterns of placemaking. It is Jane Jacobs, who was an author, journalist, and theorist, and activist, who wrote a lot in, in the US uh, about the cities, um, especially New York, and how it was changing towards more top-to-down way of planning. And we have Holly White, who was also the founder of Project for Public Spaces, content of, from which this organization will be sharing in a bit more, who was one of the first ones to pinpoint the term of placemaking through his work and observations about how people actually use public space. And he used to say that it's hard to create a space that will not attract people. What is remarkable is how often that has been accomplished. And unfortunately, architects and us as urban planners and designers have been developing spaces that are not for people. Maybe to facilitate other elements that we might need for urban management, but definitely they're not there for the people. Because if you design a community around cars, you get more cars. And you end up having people in the middle of the street being scared. But if you design a community around people, in the end, you do get more people. And placemaking can be somehow related to the Maslow um, hierarchical need, um, sorry, uh, of needs. If you see this uh, diagram, you see that in the bottom of the pyramid, we have the basic needs of people who are need for safety and the basic physiological needs that we might have for food, water, warmth, rest. These are elements that translate into the element, into the aspect of the space. But if you go higher into this uh, pyramid, when we talk about the self-actualization, the needs that we might have when it has to do the feeling of accomplishment, intimate relationships and friends, then these are elements of the needs of people that translate into the place to be more social, to be more creative, to be active, fun. That sense of community can be brought through these upper elements. 
then we also have three main aspects in placemaking. If we start from the blue circle, we call it hardware. This is how we urban planners, architects, but not only, we design the public space. So what are the hardware elements? What are the elements that are like infrastructure that make the space? These are of course needed. But then how do these elements of design come into dialogue with what people need? They need to socialize, they need elements of programming, of culture, they need to be able to interact with each other. This is the software, so how people feel and use the public space. So on the one hand, we have the design of the public space, we have how people interact with the public space and what do they do. And on the last part, on the orange circle, we have the hardware, and this is how the public space is managed. And the, here it's where it comes, for instance, if you have a coalition of people caring about the public space. These are the, the, the instruments and ways that the municipality, for instance, is managing the public space. And all these three elements should be in constant dialogue in order to have a holistic approach towards uh, public space. This is something that I will show you briefly, but it's interesting to keep it in mind when you're working with schools. We have the power of 10. It's another one basic element of uh, placemaking. So in uh, the power of 10, you're discussing how can a city or a region have 10 interesting and distinctive districts and destinations? It could be neighborhoods. So how can we, from each of these neighborhoods, have inside every neighborhood 10 places to go? It can be a food market, it can be a playground, it can be a school. And within each of these places, let's, say, let's take the school, how can we have 10 things to do? If you take it from the outside to the inside, you see this dynamic. But that, what if we were to plan, starting from the school that has 10 things to do inside the school, and we go all the way up? Wouldn't our cities be way more interesting and way more interactive? This is a, a translation of the power of them as I have just shown it to you. And then another element of placemaking is not only about how we look at it from the top to down, so let's say how you put the, um, the, the activities or the, or the design of a public space, but it's also what's happening on the horizontal element, on the parallel to your eyes. So what is happening on the ground floor of, uh, of the buildings and how can we translate the power of 10 into the ground floor? So you, here you see an interesting example of how a bookstore can actually become a place of interest just because it is hosting small activities but that bring a lot of interest to the ground floor of the building. And now we're coming a little bit more, not theory exactly, but let's say aspects of place that make it, that, that, um, that you can use them in order to evaluate a place, whether it comes from the point of view of placemaking. So the main four attributes that make a good place are sociability, uses and activities, comfort and image, and access and linkages. And these are the four things that we always look into a place into a place in order to evaluate it. And here is the process of placemaking. First of all, you have to define what is the place that you want to work on and what are the key stakeholders. So what is the community? What are the people that you should really involve into your process? Then you go out and evaluate the space based on this diagram and identify what are the issues. And you do that with the community, eh? because in placemaking we say the community is the expert. So you go out in the space and you evaluate your space together with your community. And together with your community, you develop a vision. Where would you like your, what, what would you like your place to look like, not only in five years from now, but even from today? What are the short-term experiments that you can take today to improve your place? And what are the changes and improvements you can make in order to reach your vision up to five years from now? Here you, see, here you see one of the main and basic tools that we're using in placemaking in order to kickstart a placemaking process. It's the place game. I will share with you afterwards in the chat, in the chat um, a toolkit where you can find many, many tools uh, from Placemaking Europe about uh, and from Project Public Spaces on how to evaluate the place. I don't think I have if you want me, I can maybe we can then introduce them in the, the Q&A. What is important in the placemaking process 
is to understand what is the intuition behind the place. So what are we doing? What are the places, the people, the dreams, and the data that we have about the place? Then it's about collaboration. With whom are we doing the whole process? Who do, whom do we want to bring to the table? Who is already involved, but who is, already, who is also missing and whom we should bring there? And then to iterate. What should happen next? We should always evaluate the process. In place, maybe we say that you're never done. What are the learnings that you're receiving and how can you put them as a feedback and game into your process? And how can we grow bigger? And the approach that we want to use is a, what we, some people call tactical urbanism or some in place maybe we might also call it lighter, quicker, cheaper. So how can you improve the place lighter with the small interventions, quicker, things that can happen even from today and cheaper because it's important to make it sustainable. Placemaking is organizing your happy accidents by opening up to unexpected initiatives, emerging from an engaged community. Placemaking about how, is about how can you plan the unplanned together with your community. This is the first case of uh, placemaking. I'm afraid I don't have time to show it now, but I will also share a link in the chat box. It was the Bryant Park in New York in front of the library. And see, here you see pictures of how the library has adopted the park with this small activation elements by introducing play, music, places where people can work from, places for children, and the program that changes between seasons and people get to know about it while they're in the park. Here are some resources. I will also put those in the chat box. So thank you very much. Apologies for taking a little bit longer. And uh, Laska, the floor is yours now. Thank you, Vivian. Um, and uh, guys, I mean, what Vivian shows and the principles of placemaking, um, we use uh, community quite a lot. But, you know, when you think about a space or public space, the school and its realm could be also accepted as such. The community could be uh, the school teachers, the students and their parents. So, you know, the reference of how we can redesign uh, the space uh, like the quicker cheaper also sets into the movement uh, spaces at schools toolkit um, i will share with you the draft of the toolkit please uh, note that uh, as content um, it's almost done unfortunately it was becoming 60 pages and i needed to cut cut it to 30, 35, maybe 40 pages. Um, but I will present to you how we have designed the toolkit. So it really suits your needs and it suits the conversations that you lead with, uh, with your schools. Just give me a second to expand it and then to share screen. Okay. So, what is the lo logic behind the movement spaces toolkit? So the first logic is that before starting with the toolkit, I talked with some of you of how you use the toolkit. Um, and this is also I consider as a placemaking as I first collect, we first collected the data. Um, and what uh, uh, as a feedback I gathered is that actually you need a toolkit that could be easily taken in bits and pieces and parts. So you share um, the information and uh, the, the tools and, and the guides to your schools in a smaller format, in a bite-sized format. So when designing the toolkit, we designed the toolkit in uh, three distinctive um, segments um, and they are also linked to who do we intend to, to use these segments so of course the first part of the toolkit it's about inspiring inspiring you it's about case studies um, of course setting the, uh, the scene the movement spaces what is it the place making what it is grocery of school physical activity related terms you know which could help you also um, and these were developed uh, as part of the moving schools words which will help you also frame um, and unify terms that we use when we talk to schools and then we have the case studies where, you know, we give you examples of reimagining schoolyards and playgrounds, not only from Europe, but around the world. Um, and 
this section is intended to you because we know that when we speak about placemaking, when uh, we speak about activating schools and especially about changing the schoolyard in each country, you have your particular regulations and a way of working with the schools. So the first part is to give you this, this, this park, this possibility of how things could be done. Um, and uh, the examples are collected from our own network. What you see is from Brazil um, and our member Seski and how they activated, they, they don't have a schoolyard, but they're using the public square uh, to activate the kids during the physical education classes. Um, and you will find smaller and bigger examples of different ways to redesign and to rethink the schoolyard. Of course, we have the examples from Denmark, Copenhagen, where we can say, yeah, this is impossible, but hopefully this will be our mark for schools of the future. Uh, we also have an example, don't mind the pictures, uh, also from Bulgaria, from BGB Active, from your own colleague uh, also participating in the schools per day. We've collected different case studies linked to greening of the yards or uh, having the kids um, and this uh, pump truck uh, is very interesting case because it's connected also with environmental education and sustainability. Kids collect plastic so they can in return get their own bike rack. We also have case studies of calming the streets around the schools uh, around Swole streets events um, and how you know the the whole community within the school and around the school could be uh, rethought and uh, uh, reimagined what we have given you is the guide to the source the contact person um, and then if you decide to take any of these case studies and transfer it to your setting you can do so um, in regards with um, your activities on the national level. Then we have the do section or do it yourself section. This section is about the schools that you work with. So this is the school level. And how we have designed it is that it's a very easy to be used. For example, um, it's a, what about uh, drawing on the schoolyard? Because this is in the realm of cheap, uh, quick and uh, light. Um, and what we will be providing you and of course your schools is an easy slide where the guidance of how the activity could be implemented could be downloaded and translated. Also, what you see here, you see the cha cha steps. Uh, these will be provided as templates. So, you know, we don't just say you can do the cha cha, you can get this from Pinterest, but we also uh, provided you with templates and guides how the schools can do it. Um, again, we've given different examples. For example, this is a peace path where actually this could be a bigger. Uh, bigger activity where kids not only design their space and draw their space, but together with teachers, uh, they speak about um, no hate language and uh, acceptance and inclusion. Um, there are simple and different interventions uh, that you can do with the schoolyard and uh, uh, this is not a simple one. Uh, what you see here, this is from Valencia. This is an actual basketball court. Uh, again, I will change that uh, when we finalize the toolkit, but this is a bigger initiative that was created uh, with local designers and streets artists to completely uh, coverify, if there's a word in English, uh, the, uh, the, the sport ground of the uh, of this this particular place, but this is done also in schools, um, and you can work with a local either company or street artist to completely change your schoolyard and just with asphalt paint brushes and the communities uh, you can make the schoolyard more interesting. Then we have the medium to do interventions. These are more complex to do. Again, uh, quite interesting, but they will give the students, the kids and the teachers more ability to interact uh, with the students and give them completely different set of um, activities. Um, these are also presented. We also have uh, in school activity games. Uh, where we provide your schools with a set of different games that comes from different parts of the world. Again, 
with the design and the rules of play. Uh, but this part could be used uh, also if you have national games that uh, uh, you can introduce, you can even design your own slide based on these ideas. Um, and I believe, and what I like to think of this toolkit, it's a live toolkit. It's going to be in a, a PDF format for easier sharing over the SSD slide, but we are also looking for ways that it's live also on the web so we can constantly add the different uh, events and activities. Um, here there's the three days uh, stickers activation. This is um, a different way um, and needs to be finalized, of course, different way to activate the schoolyard. If the school does not want to paint their yard, it could be done with 3D stickers for the foreground that can be later removed. Um, and then when we have all these um, examples of um, events activation, also part of placemaking is the programming as Vivian said, so we give you, I know that you know it, but also for your schools, the different uh, events and activities that we do in the network, such as Move Week, the Daily Mile now uh, that we work with um, then for European Mile. And then we have the last part, which will become a little bit bigger. It's again for you where you find more resources and more reading materials so you make uh, and continue uh, uh, implementing the movement spaces concept into your national plans of activation working with schools or with other partners that you have on the national level. So this is in a very brief uh, and we are working hard that you have the toolkit um, to you uh, um, and to your schools in a good time so you can share and use it. Okay, Vivian, back to you. Thank you, Laska. I'm looking forward to use the toolkit also with my schools uh, when, the, when we are able to, to enter the schools again, because in Greece, unfortunately, now uh, as we are, that we're not educators, we're not allowed yet to go inside the school, but uh, I'm going to use it definitely. So thank you very much for that. Uh, one moment to find my screen again. Excellent. Uh, so now I would like to give the floor to, to Sam. Uh, we're going now to the second part of our first of our webinar in order to start sharing from our own experiences of practices. After Sam's presentation, we will also have some time for Q&A uh, in case you want to reflect something back on what you have heard so far before we go into the co-creation part. So if you have any questions, uh, please keep them in your notebook or in the mirror board that we have shared. Uh, Sam, would you like to share your own um, slides? Yeah. Excellent. I uh, believe you have access to the sharing, uh, right? Yeah. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning. Um, can I get a thumbs up if you can all hear me? There we go. Awesome. Um, my name is Sam Balto. I'm a physical education teacher in Portland, Oregon. Um, I've also taught phys ed in Washington, D.C. and Boston, Massachusetts. And it's really special to be on such an international uh, workshop, webinar. Um, I've been very fortunate. I've been to over 20 countries, which I really feel has sort of helped create how I view spaces and you know, not feeling limited by what you know I might have only seen in the United States, but really being able to see things all around the world. So um, I'm going to be sharing some thoughts um, about creating movement spaces at schools. But um, I wanted to start with a quote really quickly uh, from former President Barack Obama. And I say this quote because as a phys ed teacher, I feel alone a lot of times at a school and in a community. And I wanna say this because even though we are all around the world, you know, we all have the same passion of working with children to you know, better their development. So we are not alone, we are all together. So the quote is, it's only when you hit your wagon to something larger than yourself that you realize your true potential. So I really feel like this topic is incredibly important and it's really special that we're all together doing this today. Um, so oh, there we go. So these are some photos during COVID when it first started, I uh, 
painted tactical urbanism to close off my street. We painted, I spray painted uh, physically distant family squares. So every family on our block uh, had their own square. And every day from about March until the end of June, we would have PE class in the street. And it was incredible. Um, I'm also a uh, avid tactical urbanist, so an advocate for safe routes to school. Um, and at my school in Boston, Massachusetts, you might have heard of the football player Tom Brady. I put his face on a crosswalk sign to bring attention to a school crossing that uh, kept on getting hit that was very unsafe for children. And that ended up resulting um, in over a million dollar grant to improve infrastructure in that area of Boston. Um, and another project, this one was also international. We called it the Red Cup Project to show how paint um, on bike lanes does not provide protection. So you put the red cups or red tomatoes out and you know you wait a couple of minutes and they get smashed. Um, and uh, it's amazing how some media really can make some changes sometimes to the uh, built environment to make spaces safer for people biking. Um, so to set the stage, I think there's three numbers I want us to sort of understand. You know, we all agree 60 minutes of physical activity is recommended daily for children, 30 minutes for adults. So how do we, how do we accomplish that? Globally, only 81% 81, 81 of children do not accomplish that. And according to the World Health Organization, 5 million deaths per year could be averted if the global population was more active. So these are you know, very concrete facts that we are here to try to solve. And I think myself as a phys ed teacher, I see my students five days a week. But in the United States, at some schools, I've only had my kids once a week for 45 minutes. In Portland, I have them twice a week for 30 minutes each time. They have recess. But where are they getting those 60 minutes of physical activity if they're not happening at school? Um, and so I've become really passionate about making sure that and encouraging children walking and biking to school to sort of create that built-in physical activity um, and the pandemic has really shown the value of space. Um, you know, with everything being closed, space, the value of space has gone up tremendously. Um, and so as a school teacher, as, you know, as somebody who works in the school community, a school campus should be serving the school and students to its highest degree. Um, and so I'm going to do a little case study of what we've done at my school, where I'm more or less arguing that the school parking lot does not serve our students to the highest degree. Um, so, you know, school assets are students, teachers and staff, the community, the school campus facilities, and also the streets around the school. So how do we leverage those assets to benefit the children at that school and the greater community as well? So this is my school. Um, the orange and the green is the total campus. Um, and the green is the parking lot, which is about one fifth of the school campus. And it surrounds, you know, two of the major sides. And, you know, any space that has cars is not friendly for children. So why do we have such a large space devoted for, you know, storage of automobiles right next to a school? Um, so what I started to do was, you know, think about how can we make our school more child friendly and improve physical fitness outcomes. And I sort of started to do that with the parking space. Um, so parking lot reimagined. So what we started to do was uh, we had a grant and we got students feedback to create some murals. Um, and I think by just like Vivian's talking about, you know, brightening up a space, making it more human scale. Um, we solicited students feedback on how to, you know, what kind of murals to do. So there's the solar system. We had a new crosswalk where they got to design the crosswalk and a butterfly um, design. And it's, you know, pretty amazing to then bring able to bring the community together 
to then be able to paint it. So here are some, this is the before of the parking lot and the after. So now you can kind of see how, you know, you're a student, a middle schooler looking out the window. This is what you saw before was just parked car and asphalt. Now you see, you know, beautiful blotter flies all over the place. Um, this was the crosswalk to the field and this is it now. This was an area outside our youngest grades that was just usually used for uh, the trash pickup. And this is our solar system. Um, and during the pandemic, even though we were apart from our students, there was opportunities when students would come to pick up food and other supplies. And it brought me a lot of joy when I saw one of my students and her mother leaping over the different stars. Um, so, you know, they're getting that physical activity, even though the building is not open, it is still a community space. It is, you know, something that can still bring joy and children can still feel connected. Um, I personally found myself during the pandemic when the building was closed, I would just go to the campus because it just gave me those same feelings. And we want to create that for our students um, and the community. It is a a school is a, you know, an incredibly important place um, for communities. So we want to, you know, build it up and make it as special as it possibly could be. So the parking lot before on top was, you know, parent drop off. Now with the mural, we were able to create something called the Thrive Zone. So basically what we did was we moved, I'm glitching, um, we moved the drop-off area just back. We moved it back about uh, 150 feet um, using some cheap bollards, some cheap posts, and then daily I would put out the orange cones. Um, and parents would just drop their kid off 150 feet farther away. But if there's no car moving, then it's safe. The second there's a car moving close to that area, naturally parents are gonna wanna drop their kid off to the closest point. So if you just created no car spaces, it's an agreement, it's safe now, parents feel comfortable dropping their children off. And they get, you know, the children get an extra 100, you know, 50 feet of physical activity. And they're also not inhaling exhaust from other parents, you know, dropping off their children. And sort of what we've been thinking about now as we start coming back to school is how to, you know, potentially remove some of the parking spots and create something new there, something that uh, ser serves the, you know, school community and the students even better. So an outdoor classroom was an idea, a kindergarten play area, so activities and games that are more focus towards child, uh, younger children. Um, and then like a sensory imagination garden. All right, so these are three ideas that I wanted to share that I think can be used anywhere um, around schools. So one is called the traffic garden project, plazas around schools and public right of way for play. So the traffic garden project, if you might have heard of traffic gardens, they're miniature infrastructure streets for children to learn biking and pedestrian skills. And these can be made with chalk. So in the, on the left picture um, during our COVID PE, I just chalked a figure eight. And then the kids on roller skates who are practicing their rollerblades were able to work on navigating that with each other. Um, to the right, was the first traffic garden I did with a spray paint at my school on a spot of the blacktop that wasn't being used. So there's just nothing there. Um, and the amazing thing is when you paint these traffic gardens, children magically show up. You know, no matter whatever you're doing, what time of day, they see it. They, I almost feel like they sniff out like something that's child friendly and they just appear. So, um, I'm not, here's a, um, a YouTube, I'll put it into the chat. I don't want everybody's computers to glitch, um, but this is another traffic garden I did in Portland. And these traffic gardens cost me maybe $50. 
um, to spray paint. And the return on investment for $50 is just, you know, you can't beat it. These two hours with some friends and it's temporary. So you can modify it. You can change it. During COVID, I wasn't really able to get much, you know, children and community input. But the goal is, you know, as we start reopening more and coming together more, we can take it to the next level and make it more permanent. And I have a map of all the traffic gardens that were done in the United States, um, Seattle, Portland, Bend, Virginia, North Carolina. I'm waiting for some to be done uh, internationally. So please send them to me when you create them. Another, you know, same idea is uh, creating space around schools are plazas. Um, so just pretty much moving car parking reclaiming that space around schools allows parents to physically distance. You know, it's a calmer space. You know, you see seniors sitting here, um, but it also is creating the school, you know, a school is a community space, not a space that you drop your kids off and leave. It's a place to connect. And I really think, you know, plazas are a really cool idea to, after being apart so long, to bring people back together um, in a really meaningful way. And schools, I believe, do have a role in that. That is something that I think schools should be focusing on um, because it is part of, you know, children wellness. You know, when communities are more connected, students feel safer. Um, in Milan, Italy, they're really taking this to the next level. To the next level, um, there should be it should be switching, but. Um, they're reclaiming tons of spaces around schools, painting murals, putting up ping pong tables um, in these spaces and just sort of letting the community take over. And it's pretty amazing. Um, if the, the Mitrio, if he's on some podcasts and some videos, and it's just really awesome to hear how he communicates um, about these interventions and how successful they are. And this is one that I found in uh, United Kingdoms where a school fundraised to create a playground space in the street. So they used, you know, relatively cheap materials to create more space for children using the public right away. Um, this is a project I worked on in Boston where we used student bus stops. So children waiting for the bus are just standing there. That is a time that we could be engaging them and they could be getting physical activity and learning and interacting with their peers or adults. So uh, working with the city, they created four different types of uh, active bus stops. And some were, you know, mazes, some were more physical, some were musical, um, but you know, it's about engaging children. And, you know, if we think about those 60 minutes, it doesn't say how you get the 60 minutes. It could be 30 seconds here, one minute here, 10 minutes there. We just got to get to 60 minutes. Um, so I think that this was a really great way to engage children around that. And uh, as physical education and fitness experts, we should advocate for our streets for kids. Um, the pandemic has clearly shown, you know, how creating more space for children directly impacts their wellness but also their you know, ability to be physically active and to develop those skills. Um, you know, the difference between a child learning how to ride a bicycle in the street versus on a sidewalk is totally different. Um, also talking about how air pollution impacts children is a direct correlation of how they do you know, with their physical health outcomes. One of my schools in Boston, one out of every four students had asthma. Um, and I think, you know, as physical, you know, experts, making the connection between traffic fatalities and children wellness, of course, but, you know, creating streets that are safe for children are going to be better for their development. Um, and these are two great resources that I use. One of them, uh, Designing Streets for Kids is a must, uh, tons of case studies, amazing photos. It's in multiple languages. And then uh, Urban Playground by Tim Gill is another amazing resource. And um, 
This is a photo from my bachelor party. It's a celebration before you get married. Uh, my bachelor party was in Washington, DC and I wanted to play games everywhere. So this is us playing four square in front of the White House. Um, and I do wanna say, I am willing to move to any country that would like to hire me. I am very eager to travel and expose my children to this wonderful world. So if you liked what I had to say and uh, would like to invite me out, I would uh, love to come. So thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sam. It's, it's a great one. Uh, yeah. Uh, amazing examples and thank you for sharing uh, with us and I see the chat uh, and you can see it with yourself. Um, I have before I forget and before we go to the Q&A, I miss to not case studies but practical examples of traffic garden projects and uh, public schools bus stop. So you will hear from me and I hope yeah. that you share with us the how-to oh, behind the these two examples so we can add it to the toolkit. Yeah, so this one, uh, I think I skipped this. So I did it last summer and then a couple months ago, I looked on Google Maps, like the aerial, and then they showed up. So these are five out of the six traffic gardens that I did wow. uh, with other teachers. And they showed up in Google Maps, which I mean, I feel like is very official now. Um, so, yeah, and, old, and the truth old, is, old enough, and I believe that uh, all the, the colleagues that are here, they would love to also have access to the how to, of, you know, because this is just joke. It's not, as you say, $50, 40 euros. Yeah, uh, it's doable. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I think, you know, it's one of these things, um, the second, like working with a school, the second you ask the school for the money, like you ask a, the principal or the leadership, can I get the $50? It's not going to happen. You know, it, there's all these hoops. So it's, I would just go to the principal and say, can I do this? And I covered the money. And then of course it comes back and people donate, but I didn't, it's not all I'm asking them is for them to put it on Facebook, to share it with families you want to make the point of entry as easy as possible for school communities. Um, teachers, principals, very busy. Um, so you don't want to like add multiple more steps is what I would definitely say. Okay, now we are to the Q&A session. I think for some is already 12 midnight. So, but he's here with us for Q&A session guys. Yeah. And you can unmute yourself and ask it directly. Uh, just raise your hand so I can give you the word. Uh, Cameron, raise his hand, please. I'll ask it. Hi, Samuel, how are you? Can you see me yeah, there? How are you? Yeah. Yeah, really good. Uh, firstly, thanks a mil, Samuel. Found that really inspiring, really insightful. I thought it was brilliant. Um, I've just got a quick question, and the question is, uh, sorry, sorry, can you hear me there? Yeah, just, yeah I think it's broke up there, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the, the question is around the physical health of children and, and actually within the classroom. So um, two things that have come up is one, sitting and standing desks and, and, you know, going between both of them so they're not sitting all the time. Uh, and the second one is, is the weight of their school bags and the effect that that has on their skeleton long term. Um, not really up, up with, with what you're doing. I, I know it's physical activity in outdoor spaces, but uh, I, just, I just thought if, if, you, if you had any, any opinions or, or, or any experience in, in tackling that. Um, honestly, I have not. That's not, I feel like the desk is something that like has not fully integrated into schools in the US yet, or at least at schools that I've been at. And the backpack thing, I don't, we don't like, I don't think we overload our kids with books. I mean, at the elementary school, so with the little kids, but that, I mean, that's completely valid. I mean, I remember having tons of books in my backpack as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's different experiences between Europe and uh, US, but uh, yeah, standing desks. That's uh, 
somewhere. Okay, any other questions or comments to some? Yes, Helen. Hi, Sam. I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask how supportive or not your colleagues of different subjects were in your school when you started um, doing what you're doing. Yes, that's a really great question. So um, what I have found is, you know, absolutely as a teacher, having good relationships with the teachers of all subjects, um, you know, is critical. I'd say the biggest barrier is, you know, painting a mural is there's, you know, there's not much, uh, you know, controversy around that. Having going after so many of the parking spots was a little bit different of experience. But I would say as a teacher, what I have found is if I have money, so if there's grant money, you know, or some sort of funds and parents support, so parents are the ones that are pushing it, the principal and leadership aren't going to say anything. You know, so they're basically, you go to the principal and say, this is what we want to do. Here's the money. You know, you don't have to figure anything out besides saying yes. You know, here's a community event that brings people together, connects the, you know, we're creating something. I mean, if you present it in that kind of way, people don't say no. I'd say if you're, go from my experience, trying to create the outdoor classrooms with the parking lot and removing spots uh, was a little challenging to do virtually. You know, you kind of need those more intimate conversations with people to get a better sense of how they feel. Let's say I definitely did not pick up on all those signals, uh, you know, through Google Meets or just not seeing people as we would if we were in person. Super, thank you. Any other questions or I can ask, oh, I think you touched upon the, 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 the permissions, I think also with the different countries and the different, uh, ways regulations work with schools and you mentioned that uh, having the parking lot and i i saw also the yeah. streets how easy or how difficult was to issue a permission for that one and um do you need a permission i mean i think closing yeah, the that's a need, but... great question um so it's totally i think that's that's a really wonderful question a school campus has different bureaucracy than a city street. So if I wanted to close down like and do a school street, you know, so during arrival and dismissal, the street by the school is closed to cars moving. I could, there's no way I could do that in Portland in the next several years. But my school parking lot, we have a lot more control over. Um, and basically it just comes down to the principal approving it. You know, you need to do community outreach and, you know, get a wide range of people sharing their ideas and concerns. But a school parking lot on your facilities has much different bureaucracy than, you know, a city street uh, can be much more challenging depending on where you are. But I think the key is you want to get victories. Uh, people want to work with winners. You know, people. Time is valuable. You know, we don't have tons of extra time these days. So if I'm presenting something, I want to execute and actually create something. So you want to start with tangible things that you can actually execute on. You know, going for some big 100,000 euro idea, it's too much. You know, go for the $50 traffic garden and then go from there, you know, build little victories, show that you can execute and do something and that you're going to respect people's time um, is what I have found to be part of my success. And by starting, you know, by me focusing on the school campus, I'm here now because of that. You know, it's sometimes it's about the perception. It's not about the reality. It's about the perception of what you're doing. And so I can communicate this idea of not having cars idling right next to the building, you know, in a different way that 
I wouldn't be able to show if I was advocating for school streets, which would impact the public right away. Um, so, yeah. Amazing. I think that I can use your, uh, quoting you right away, uh, start with tangible things you can execute on uh, to, to, to thank you uh, yeah. with this thought because it's very much aligned to what we want to offer to the national coordinators of European schools per day and all the insights. I mean, coming from a physical education teacher, I believe it will help the partners also to find the right words and the right motivation when they speak with their uh, with 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 their schools, with uh, their members and their their physical education teachers. So once again, thank you very much for yeah. sitting up late and offering all Absolutely. this this inspiration. I see also in the chat that uh, all the the, the participants uh, liked it, and uh, yeah, yeah, I'm smiling. I'm inspired. Yeah, so, you know, and on, I, painting I streets. Here I come. I I really do, you know, please email me um, anything I, I do. I'll send, I have like more information about how to do traffic gardens and such, but you know, we are, this is a community. This is something very special. So um, please don't ever hesitate to reach out um, if, with questions or concerns. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, you please stick around or if I start closing, uh, uh, I, I wish you a good night's sleep thank you. when you thank decide you, to go, but thank you again and uh, we'll be in touch. So back to Vivian um, and uh, example from Greece, no? Hey, thank you. I think uh, what uh, Sam just presented is very much uh, how I feel about the school. So I'm, I'm sticking very much to what, to what Sam said about the school being a community space. And uh, this, and th thank you, Sam, very much because I also received a lot of knowledge that I did I was not aware of, and I got very much inspired. So let me share my screen again. One moment, my mind. Yeah. One moment. All right. So what I will share with you is uh, from my experience through two different projects that are connected uh, that I have been working with uh, children of different age groups. The first project is called Topio and it was my first, my, my kickstart, let's say, with working with schools and with children and with youth specifically. So at some point in 2015, I realized that all my work that I was doing with placemaking so far was about um, let's say adult people, the normalization of uh, someone who would participate in those processes. And I was not very much pleased with myself with that. <laughs> and in Greece, uh, we have a lot, huge lack of public spaces, huge lack. And we have these schools in every neighborhood that no one is using after school hours. So we have a great loss of uh, human capital being the children and youth that, that no one is including them into the participation processes and have spaces that again, no one is facilitating them. So something that was not uh, clicking for me. So I decided to develop an embedded educational program, I call it by my own, uh, on active citizen and placemaking. And my question was, how can I go, how can I get into the system of schools? So how can I get into the formal educational system of Greece in the public high school and train children aged between 16, 15 and 17, 18, on how to become active citizens and later on the placemakers of their own neighborhood. So we worked a lot with the, the school, how to change the participation processes, the inside of the school, but also by engaging the rest of the community, the public space around the school and the local public park. So I will not show you the full methodology, but some uh, um, ideas and uh, learnings that I have had about how to activate children. And the second project from which I'm distilling uh, experience and learnings is the Citadel Level for Kids project. This is part of the of an international program that we are running called the Citadel Level, which is, a, which is about place making and how to work. It's a project that I showed you with participation of uh, people on the ground floor. So what's happening also inside the building, not only on the public space, so this kind of system. And the book, and the Citadel Level for Kids is a book. It is a co-creative 
a book by many case studies around the world. I think we have received more than 100 case studies. It is a methodology that we have developed for participation of younger children. So our book is mostly aimed at children between the age of zero and five. So in there, we also have the participation of uh, their caregivers and parents. And uh, how, how can you do that through a placemaking approach? I will share later on uh, links in the chat so you can find more uh, ideas about it. So what are, from my experience and from my, our experience at the city at high level in the top your teams, um, what are our eight key steps to engage children? The first one is to make the engagement child-led. So how can you give actually the facilitation of the whole process to the children? How can you empower them with the tools and the, how can it, and the, and the empowerment and the feeling of pride and ownership that they will run the process? Here you see in the picture, the child running, showing the, his parents where are the places that he would like to go. So how does this child, I think it was eight, four years old, how does this child uh, evaluate and feel the public space of his neighborhood? Another way to do that is to give them the tools of how to design their own spaces. Here is an example that we went inside the public high school in the city of Beria in, uh, in, uh, in Greece. And the children themselves designed with architectural drawings and with their own means how they would like to change their schoolyards. In most of their plans, physical activity was a very much uh, prominent element of how they would like to see the schoolyards. So we gave them the first role into the whole process. The second uh, key learning was how to make the engagement playful. How do you engage the children in a way that it's not so much about doing an activity, like doing a task and then be done with it, but how do you activate their own processes of expression, of playfulness? And you can either do this by, you know, integrating elements of play, of colors and everything, or integrating elements of non-formal education. In this game that you see now in this picture, we have invited students uh, in our high school to, to take on roles of administration about decision making. So we invited them to be one of them be the mayor, the one that want to be a school major, the school principal, to be a teacher, to be a student, to be a parent. So by assigning them tools and asking them questions, they were reflecting on the role and the power that they have on the decision making of what can happen in the public space. So playfulness can have many different perspectives of how you engage children. The third key learning is how to make engagement reciprocal. We're not only there to engage the child as facilitators, we're also there that the child can engage with us as well. And not only with the child or the teenager, we're there to engage with the parents and the caregivers as well, with the rest of your community. Some already said that he engaged with the, with the rest of the teachers, with the rest of the community, with the school principal. So you have to develop um, a network of relationships around the engagement in order to also have an ecosystem that the child will also feel safe to express and be, be engaged in the process. Here is, I wanted to share this picture, but I don't like to share pictures of myself. But at some point in the end of the process that we were running with the school in the, on the island of Krita, it was the students without me asking for feedback. I have asked it before, but they came to me and started sharing their feedback and running around me. So this feeling of having this dialogue with the children and the youth and myself as a facilitator being also part of the empowerment and, and engagement process was one of the most uh, important elements. And the reason why I'm also staying in the, that I'm all in, in, inside this kind of process because I'm learning maybe even more than the kids are. The fourth learning is how to stimulate their creativity. Sometimes kids' creativity can seem messy to the eyes of an adult, but the point is not here to be very, you know, uh, tidy and have everything according to our own aesthetics. So what we offer to the, to the youth is some ideas in order to translate them to their own creativity, to their own means of expression. So we have been using a lot of street art and tools that they can, that they are very close to them. 
And um, he used to have painted a little bit of architectural, mm -hmm. I don't know how it's called in English, in Greek it's maqueta, maquette, like a, like a model of the school yet and what they would like to create without having to use the, the expensive or the maybe too sensitive materials that architects would use. We invited them to bring materials from their own home, like uh, cotton, um, toothpicks, uh, foam, things that they can use in order to express their creativity and design the schoolyard that they are imagining. The fifth element is to build trust, deriving about how you engage and you make your, uh, your process reciprocal. If you are there to listen and not so much to talk or offer, you develop uh, a sense of trust. Uh, and this can happen not only with the, with, the, with, the, with the parents, the caregivers, the teachers, but it's very important to also build it together with the students that you're working with. And something I have learned as well, especially with the students, is in order to receive their trust, you need to listen to their own needs and aspirations. This is a mural that we have created outside the school. And while we were working inside the classroom with the students, and we were discussing about what we should do with the, with the wall outside the school, they were saying that, yeah, it looks ugly, but on the other hand, we have so many tags and graffiti outside the school that it's part of the history of the school. And we don't want to, to delete it. So how can we bring this in a way to the present, make it something that facilitates our need, which their need was double. On the one hand, to preserve the history of the wall, and the other hand, to make, and on the other side, to make it something that is relevant to them. So we created together with them this mural that still has left space for the old graffiti to show up, while in the meantime making the rest of the wall something that they also like. And in this way, we also gain the trust that we're there to listen to both their needs and facilitate the process. You have to learn by doing. There is no other way. It's very context sensitive what you're planning to do. Uh, and you can only learn by really going out there, testing things, evaluating together with your, with your students and with your teachers, and then coming back to the process to see what else might work better the next time. And of course, as Sam also yes, to use tactical urbanism with kids. Go out there, be messy, try out things, and uh, be very much light. Things that you can do the same day. If a child comes up with an idea that can happen even from the same day, if the rest of the classroom agrees, go ahead and try to see what might happen. Here, you see we have also used chalks uh, inside the schoolyard after the children have designed their ideas. Since we didn't have money at that moment to implement the ideas, we tried with chalks to see on the ground, on the floor of the, of the schoolyard, where these activities could go. Here you see that the students were in a trampoline. So I, I invited them to consider how much would they want their trampoline to be. So they designed it here. And here they're designing, um, how it is called? How, Alaska, can you help me? How is called this fence that uh, youth are using for uh, calisthenics to hang from and do activities? The street fitness furniture? The monkey bar? Yes, 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 this one, exactly. Mm. So the students were already doing this outside but they wanted also to bring into their schoolyard. And because they were already sport, uh, doing this kind of sports, they knew exactly the dimensions while I didn't know how to do it. So they went on the yard and designed it the way they wanted it and they knew.